This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Thanks for listening to the ungated version of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. If you want to read some essays on some of these topics, please check out razib.substack.com. Again, that's razib.substack.com. Thank you. Hey, everybody. This is Razib with the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. So this week, um, as I sometimes do, I'm not going to be talking to anybody else. Uh, I will just be talking to myself about a new paper, uh, you know, new finding, that I think is very important for people to know. Uh, this is a finding and a paper. If it if it turns out to be supported by future publications, future data, uh, to be correct, uh, that I think will be an incredibly important paper that will transform our understanding of what it means to be human and how our human lineage came to be. Um, yeah, so... Um, The paper is uh, A Structured Coalescent Model Reveals Deep Ancestral Structure Shared by All Modern Humans. Kind of a mouthful, I'm sure. Uh, You're thinking, what does that mean? But um, before I get to that, the first author is Trevor Cousins. Uh, The second author is Alwyn Scali. And the last author is Richard Durbin. It looks like Alwyn Scali. Alwyn Scali. I actually don't know how to pronounce Alwyn's name too well. Apologies, Alwyn. Um, only know you from social media, um, and Richard Durbin. Uh, they're actually the, they're both equal contributors. Uh, I think cousins, uh, you know, worked with both of them uh, as supervisors. Uh, Alwyn is a uh, pretty pretty smart guy on social media. If you've ever interacted with him, um, you know, you know, I guess he's mid career. You can say something like that. Richard Durbin is a pretty famous individual uh, within genomics, population genetics uh, in England. And a lot of great people have come out of his uh, group and developed a lot of great methods. So, um, you know, you you know that for a fact. If you uh, listen to this podcast and read Population Genetics papers, uh, Richard Durbin will definitely be known to you. So um, this paper, I will kind of get to the punchline first and then then we'll work uh, back to it again. Basically, this paper is arguing that uh, anatomically modern humans from Africa, uh, sometimes called the stem lineage, uh, you know, on the order of 98 to 99.9 percent, uh, maybe, um, maybe less than 98 percent, depending on how you want to model it. But you know, on the order of 90 to 99, 99.9 percent of our ancestry of humans across the world uh, comes from the stem lineage, anatomically modern humans, out of Africa humans, Neo-Africans, you know, no, really no good good term for it yet. Uh, about 25 years ago, we would say that these are just humans, qua humans, and that they replaced everyone else. But now we know there's a little bit of Neanderthal ancestry, a little bit of Denisovan ancestry. And within Africa, there's a some variable level possibly of archaic ancestry, more speculative, more inferential, because we do not have ancient DNA or DNA ancient enough in Africa to really shed that much light on it. So that's why I said um, you know, it could be 90%. You know, depending on how much archaic admixture you model for some of these African groups, which it's very variable, but we don't really know. Anyway, um, what this paper is arguing is that modern humans arose, this stem lineage arose 300,000 years ago, about 100,000 years before the Khoisan split from other modern human lineages. Uh, but 300,000 years ago, it split from an admixture between two extremely diverged groups uh, that they, these groups diverged about 1.5 million years ago. You know, a million years is usually when you kind of say, okay, like these are humans. We got to call them all humans. It's before the Neanderthal, Denisovan, Neandersovan divergence from our African lineage. Uh, 1.5 million years ago is a really long time. And then these two lineages called population A and population B, uh, very generic terms, but population A, population B mixed 300,000 years ago. And the ratio of the mixing is 80% population A, 
So it's the dominant component and 20% population B. And uh, yeah, so these populations diverged 1.5 million years ago. They stayed separate that whole time and they came back together and created this hybrid population. Um, and we are we are the outcome of this hybrid population. And uh, population A and population B contribute to different things. We are, we are a synthesis. Uh, we are kind of a chimera. And I'll get into that in a bit. Uh, but first, um, I think, you know, I, I want to do a quick review of where we were in terms of the models we have and, you know, parameter spaces we're exploring in terms of the hypotheses and theories. Um, you know, as you guys know, if you've been reading this blog, reading the Substack, listening to my podcast, about 25 years ago, the dominant narrative is going to be there's a rapid out of Africa expansion from some tribe in East Africa about, say, 200,000 years ago, maybe to 50,000 years ago. It's a little confused. And this tribe replaced everybody else. And Neanderthals and all the other populations in East Asia, which you know nobody has a name for, um, disappeared. So um, that was a model, um, and we now have um, some some modifications on that model, right? Um, so we know as of 2010 that uh, the Neanderthal genome and the Denisovan genome indicate strongly that there was Neanderthal and Denisovan admixture into modern humans. Um, one thing is notable is David Reich and others have said that the original Neanderthal admixture fraction was considerably higher than the low 2%, you know, 2.2, 2.3% um, that is estimated today. But the purifying selection, which selects against the, you know, less um, quantitatively significant amount of uh, ancestry from diverged ancestry when they're hybridizing, you know, um, it selects against that ancestry because there's incompatibilities going on. In any case, um, so we know that that admixture happened uh, on the order of 45 to 50,000 50, years ago, right? So um, in any case, uh, so uh, that complicated the narrative, right? Complicated the narrative. Uh, we don't have ancient genomes from Africa, but there are various ways that you can determine that there seem to be admixture population structure within Africa. Uh, and that they had their own form of African Neanderthals, basically diverged lineages that split off and merged back into the anatomically modern stem lineage. Now, again, this is model building and inference. Um, it gets a little more you know, complicated than just looking at ancient genome from a Neanderthal, comparing it to modern humans and seeing where they're different and where they're the same. Right? You look at the variation of modern populations and you try to construct some models, see which models fit the data the best. And uh, you know, there's going to be argument about arguments about this mo these models. A couple of years ago, I wrote about an Aaron Ragsdale paper. Um, he is a population evolutionary genomicist at University of Wisconsin, now a professor. And he created a model that incorporated recurrent gene flow, some continuous gene flow, some pulsing gene flow within Africa, so that you didn't actually have these separate populations that admixed in, in a pulse manner, right? So in a pulse manner means they're separated, like for here, they're separated for 1.5 million years, and then they mix 300,000 years ago. Well, you could have another model where the mixing happens gradually over time in smaller quantities, or maybe there are mul multiple pulses, and you can't tell from the data necessarily which model um, definitively uh, is, you know, the true model, right? Because um, you don't have a real truth set, I guess, until you have ancient DNA. Ancient DNA resolves some of these arguments that, that were occurring. Um, so we have this, like, collision of models. Now, I, I want to say for out of Africa, it's a little easier because it seems clear that out of Africa populations went through a bottleneck 60,000 years ago. Uh, they went through a bottleneck for, like, you know, thousands of years, and population sizes were on the order of a 1,000. And so they, this group got really homogenized and expanded rapidly around 50,000 years ago, mixed with the Neanderthals. Uh, it simplified a, lot of, um, simplified a lot of the details of the model. And so when it's a simpler model, when reality is simpler, it's easier to make inferences from you know, the big data where there's a lot of gaps uh, because we don't have that much ancient DNA. Uh, within Africa, it's almost certainly uh, going to be more complicated uh, than the out-of-Africa model because um, that's where you know, our stem lineage, our modern African lineage, a neo-African lineage has you know, existed for almost its whole history, right? Its whole history probably. Um, you know, going back more than a million years ago, uh, it was in Africa until, you know, 
60 to 100,000 years ago, depending on how you want to you know, estimate it. Um, then they start percolating out of Africa. Now, Arabia, these areas might be biogeographically part of Africa, but um, you know, these are sort of complications included. The, the, the point here is uh, there were a lot of humans in Africa, a lot of human lineages, and the model was pretty complicated. And we don't have like really, really good resolution at this point uh, in terms of what the correct model is. Um, is it pulsed mixtures? They're deep archaic admixtures. So, um, you know, there are uh, K- Karina. Uh, I think um, uh, the Schultz, There, are, there are various groups, including David Wright's group, that believe the pulse admixture is actually the correct model. That these were highly differentiated populations within Africa that periodically mixed. You know, and then there's you know Aaron Ragsdale and some people associated with him uh, that think that more continuous gene flow, more more complicated model a uh, less clean model is actually closer to reality and you know if ragsdale is correct there would be a big difference in the out of africa migration which was kind of like a single wave and it assimilated these other archaic groups uh, kind of a simple dynamic that occurred whereas within africa it's more complicated and uh, it's more like this network gene flow that was happening over time and there wasn't a specific place within africa that modern humans arose whereas in a pulse admixture model you usually have a dominant population that's a reference population kind of and then the other populations mix into it or you know, don't mix into it you know sometimes they disappear right um so these are some of the things uh that i think you need to think about when you are thinking about this paper um again uh a structured Coalescent model reveals deep ancestral structures shared by all modern humans. And so what, what do some of these terms in the title mean? Um, so I, I want to say what coalescent model. Um, so coalescent is a theory that became really popular in the 1980s. And basically what geneticists realized is, oh, well, uh, we have these computers uh, and we can use these computers to simulate things. So, you know, you have like this genomic data, this digital data. Well, you know, Evolution happens through natural selection. It happens through random, you know, genetic drift. As you know, uh, populations that mixing. Well, you you can always simulate that, right? You can simulate that. Well, the reality is, this is what's called a forward forward simulation diverges and splits in all these different directions, and there's all these different forks in the road. And um, basically, the simulation is pretty compu- computationally intensive. Uh, it wasn't really feasible in the 1980s to do really good forward simulations. Even today, the forward simulations are, are pretty good, but you know they have limitations. Uh, they're gonna forward simulation is can, can you know, crash your server, right? Uh, but they realized some of these geneticists realized, oh, okay, well you have data in these populations, and these populations have these alleles, have these genetic variants, right? Uh, these gene copies that are variable that are mixing in the population. Well. They all at a specific genetic position. So, like, I don't know, the gen- gen- gene for lactase persistence, LCT. Well, all of the copies in LCT, I mean, they vary. Uh, some of them have LCT persistence, you know, lactase tolerance, lactose tolerance. Some of them are ancestral state, which means that they don't have the tolerance gene. Um, you know, there was natural selection that shapes kind of like the genealogy is disturbed by natural selection. You can kind of figure that out. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about here. Um, but um, the point here is they all converge back to an ancestor, an ancestral lactase tolerance gene that has a certain number of variants. And every generation you go back, you have coalescing, you have converging of the variants to an ancestor. So they keep converging and converging from all the descendant branches back to a common ancestor. And so the coalescent is actually computationally tractable because instead of like d- bifurcating and diverging into all these different paths and like just getting you know, computationally, you know, unmanageable uh, with the coalescent, you actually use less and less um, computational resources. You go back down to that last common ancestor. And the coalescent is very convenient for something like Y chromosomal lineage or mitochondrial lineage where there's no recombination because recombination makes, you know, coalescent calculations more difficult Um, because recombination is swapping segments of genome across two different gene copies and creating like new varieties, whereas the coalescent on, say, a Y chromosome or mitochondrial DNA is pretty simple. It has a uh, parent, right? It has like Y chromosome comes from the father, the mitochondrial DNA comes from the mother, a single parent, there's no recombination. And so it's a, it's a pretty natural tree instead of recombination, which allows like kind of like mixing between the branches of the trees, the way I will explain it. Um, so, okay, so you have this coalescent model, uh, and it's a really cool way to kind of create neutral evolution, create phylogenetic trees, uh, and understand uh, uh, kind of like a null model of um, uh, 
a null model of how evolution works. Uh, population, pop, evolutionary genetics, populations works with alleles. Okay, so you have the coalescent. Um, with genomics, uh, the coalescent has been um, taken to the next level. Okay, uh, so with genomics, uh, there are new methods that take this coalescent framework of having genetic variation and finding, um, you know, the patterns of the variation uh, across many, many different genes instead of just a single gene. So many, many gene trees instead of a single gene tree. Um, and then you look at these patterns of variation. And from that, you can construct a population genetic model, which has many different uh, parameters, right? And the values of the parameters are going to have different fits in terms of how well they explain the variation you see out there. So you have a model with all these different parameters, like population effective size is one of them, um, and um, you have data. That's the genomic data, right? Um, so in the 21st century, we have genomics, we have whole genomes, and we have much more powerful computers. Um, so I like looked it up, and uh, so in terms of um, the IBM mainframe uh, in, let's just see, in, yeah. IBM mainframe in 1980, um, the top of the line mainframes, these like big, big computers, had 16 to 32 megabytes of RAM. Uh, today, a lot, of a lot of desktop computers have eight gigabytes of RAM, right? So that's 250 to 500 times more memory today in a typical computer. I actually have 16 gigabytes, I think, in my MacBook Pro. Um, but anyway, uh, that's 250 to 500 times more memory today, just in a standard regular computer, than top of the line mainframe. The top of the line, like, you know, I don't want to say supercomputer, but that's the closest they had to supercomputers back then. So this is how much more power we have uh, computationally. And so there are various methods um, that do many different things, obviously, in computational genomics. Um, the method that they developed here, COBRA, C-O. B R A A is an extension of something else called uh, PSMC, um, pairwise sequential Markov chain. Yeah, and so um, I don't really want to like explain like the Markov chain and uh, you know probability distribution, sampling off of probability distribution stuff. There's a lot of details here. The the easiest way I think um, it is to explain is. Uh, PSMC is taking the whole genome and it's looking at patterns of variation along the genome. And from the patterns of variation along the genome, um, it is creating a past population history that can explain the patterns of variation along the genome. So along the genome, you have two copies of every gene. And, uh, you know, there are like 19,000 genes. There are 3 billion base pairs. There's, I don't know, you have like, think on the order of 5 million SNPs, variable positions, you know, whatever. So you have X amount of variation, and these two copies of the genes, like the gene you inherit from your mother and from your father, they converge and coalesce at some point in the future, right? So, for example, if you're an out-of-Africa individual, there is a lot of coalescence around you know, 60,000 years ago, and the affected population po size then is pretty small. Like, it's just, like, genetically much more homogenous at that point. After that p time, you know, Thank you for listening. To hear the rest of the monologue, please go to razib.substack.com and subscribe. This podcast for kids.